also um, for inviting me. It's been, it's an honor to be invited, especially by uh, usually um, beyond my uh, usual um, community of uh, colleagues. So uh, very honored to be here. <clears throat> so today I'm going to uh, share some recent work in the actually last couple of years on um, working with deep learning and how try to, to make it interpretable and trustworthy. So we live in this age of AI, everything's being called AI and there's a different discussion about what's really, what's not, but I don't think it's the most important debate. It's really about how we can make it uh, both for this uh, group profitable and also um, safe, as David um, alluded to with the vertical data science. And I like this quote from Bill Gates, AI is like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. And I'm really a data scientist, statistician, or machine learner. And under the hood of any AI uh, machine, so anything, it's really data-driven decision-making. And data science is the center of a lot of the AI enterprise. And we have these three components, computer science, math stats, and domain knowledge. But you guys would busy knowledge. And machine learning sits in the very active frontier of the computer science and math stats. So my view of data science is very much like what you guys probably very familiar, it's like quality control. It's many steps. It's really not like the factory floor, but nevertheless, it's a process. And people are at the heart of this data science or process or life cycle and will make so many human judgment calls. So um, a lot of us at least traditionally work on modeling and algorithms. If you look at the bottom of the node, and, but really the most important more and more should be concentrating on domain question. In genomics and in management, there'll be different domain questions. And that should be the driver of what we do and the standard of quality and how we um, make the process transparent. And while us, usually statistics students, most of them raise their hands, they work on modeling and algorithms. But while us, if this pipeline gives you a decision that will impact your relatives so somebody you're close to the medical decision, do you want, only want to concentrate on modeling algorithms that not? And most people raise their hand, they want to care about the whole process. So this is the main message. Let's look at data science's whole process and recognize we have a lot of human judgment calls. When you have human in the loop, then you have to go for interpretable every step, right? Not just modeling. So interpretation is at the frontier of machine learning, data science, and statistics. And EU had the GDPR seven years ago now, six years ago now. And now there's a new uh, law in EU is being discussed, which make a lot of these uh, general laws more specific. And um, I think you're going to see more movement in Europe. I hope US will follow to make this interpretability requirement series. If you look at uh, situations where interpretation is needed, FDA is struggling with how we're going to vet uh, deep learning driven radiology algorithm to help radiology find tumors, right? If it's not interpretable with billions of parameters, so should they uh, approve that? And I'm mostly work on scientific machine learning and biologists want to understand Drosophila, right? How this enhancer, uh, which is a transcription switch, start a whole process uh, from DNA to RNA, what genes drive that process? It's very basic fundamental uh, biology and therefore impact medicine and uh, other parts of biology. And we also work with uh, cosmology who try to understand the universe origin. I will get to there later. And there's a generic machine learning um, question like sentiment analysis. Oh, politicians might want to know how the public opinion is in favor, not in favor. So that's more in social science domain. As I alluded to, uh, I classify my work mostly in scientific machine learning. So scientific machine learning is a very thriving field inside machine learning and inside science that actually we're running a workshop called Interpretive Machine Learning in Nature and Social Sciences at the Summit Institute. I'm a co-chair of that uh, workshop postponed from two years ago, end of the 
end of June this year. So if you're interested, we'll have more talks from scientists talking about interoperability in sciences and social sciences. So the idea is really use science to do machine learning and use machine learning to push science forward and we iterate. And we should subject ourselves to higher standards and supported by open source and reproducible software. So when we started working on interoperable machine learning, we're already using the term for at least like eight, 10 years. The question, what really mean by interoperable machine learning? Well, I have a team from sentiment analysis to neuroscience and genomics. So we put our minds together and try to define interoperable machine learning. So this was a position paper that came out in PNS 2019. And Jamie Murdoch and Chen Den Singh were two of the leading uh, students at the time um, for these projects. So I think our major contributing here is really bring in relevance into the discussion and formally. Interpretation cannot be discussed without knowing the audience. You want the model to have reliability checks through predictive accuracy. You also want the model to be transparent enough to human to have descriptive accuracy. But all the predictive accuracy and descriptive accuracy are not relevant if you're not really solving a problem for the model or translating the meaning of the model to an audience who can understand. So really bring human in the loop. And most people think there's a trade-off. As I'll show you, not necessarily the case between descriptive accuracy and predictive accuracy. So this is something most people agree with, right? You start with the more classical statistical methods, logic regression, decision trees. People think they have good descriptive accuracy. And in small data sets, actually, they also give the best predictive accuracy. And then you move to oh, random forest, which is a bunch of decision trees and deep learning. But I will show you two of the cosmology and cell biology problems. We actually can improve both descriptive accuracy and predictive accuracy. So this trade-off is really implicitly assuming that you're already taking into account all the possible in the right way the structures of the problem through your regularization or design of your models. And then that's probably true, that if you want more descriptive accuracy, you will lose uh, predictive accuracy. However, if you haven't taken into account all the structures, any algorithm will have certain preferred like inductive bias, and that might be a mismatch to the problem. And then if you introduce the right match, in the form, as you see in adaptive wavelet uh, distillation, then you actually improve both. So what I'll concentrate on for the rest of the talk's post-hoc interoperability. So the model is already fitted, deep learning model. And we can look at global interpretation for feature importance or p-values visualization. They should be compared. We haven't done enough comparison for this different form of interpretation or can do local, local interpretation to talk about this particular case, like I'll show you, that's what we'll get to. What drives the prediction for this sentence to be classified as a positive? There's another unexplored area, um, less explored is really the whole process, which I'll get to. When you feed the model, you want that process to be trustworthy as well. So where does trust come from? I think like all of us in management science, you guys have business uh, clients and partners. And for me, it's we work with precision medicine and we want the patients to trust what we develop. One important qualitative um, trust comes from confirming existing scientific knowledge, right? Which already vetted over decades and centuries. And that's one form of trust. The other one, as I said, is you can have the whole process to be trustworthy because something new is happening here. We don't have old science to build on, but at least I can show you, I have a trustworthy quality control process and then I can actually explain how my model works through interpretation. So for the rest of the talk, I will have three parts. One part is this attempt to do generic kind of machine learning, interoperability for deep learning with sentiment analysis. And then we actually, do external validation of that methodology called ACD to cosmology, to a scientific collaboration and to use scientific knowledge to see whether that makes sense. In that context, we were brought to the Fourier domain. 
And then that motivated us to go to the local Fourier transform, which is a wavelets and do data-driven wavelet um, estimation or distillation. And then we had another external validation to use the methodology now for a completely different problem in cellular biology and to see also achieve an interpretation in big improvement and also prediction improvement. And then I'll return to the um, topic actually they were alluded to earlier and about uh, the whole process. So this is actually pretty much generic machine learning. And I should credit my uh, former student, Jamie Murdoch, for pushing forward with this. So at the time, about five years ago, people were already doing interoperability through gradient-based or occlusion-based. So this concept about importance, it's all related to perturbation, right? If you look at p-value from statistics, it's a perturbation idea of another sample could have been observed. And here you have gradient base. It's a perturbation uh, in the calculus sense. And then you go to contribution base, which you take bigger chunks out. And this, most of these methods actually are, after you fit in the model, it could come from random forest. You can get these important measures. So they're all perturbation base, and we're looking at the change. So the bigger the change, the more important. So this idea of perturbation is very much also part of the PCS framework, which I, I will go back um, at the end of the talk. So perturbation is a very important idea and you want the perturbation to be reasonable, right? So the question is why you want to do local perturbations and the different people do different perturbations. And it's very hard to argue on basic first principles that which is the right perturbation. Sometimes maybe you want to do multiple ones. So we decided to do our form of perturbation and do um, scrutinization through the results and the, the, the context. So what's missing when we started doing this interval machine learning was giving an importance for more than one feature. So you have multiple features, you have multiple words. People have already given ways of independent like um, importance measures, but we want to do things through compositionality. Can we make it also cover pairs of words, pair of genes, and things like that. So, so we want to go for uh, composite, compositional importance. And in this paper, Art Clear 2018, we had our own way of, it's better to uh, describe through this example. So you have original output, not very good. And you want to know the importance of very good versus the not. So we, we do decomposition in a kind of additive way. And we let, this is a ready fitted model. We let the relevant part run through the deep learning and the irrelevant part, and we keep track of them. So the formula is actually quite um, involved. So I won't show you, it's in the paper. And then we able to trace all of these different parts and enforcing additivity, and we get the important score are for very good. And later we generalized with uh, Chandan Singh, a student graduating right now, to the uh, image domain. So we can do the same thing for image domain. But you now have all these numbers floating around, right? So you have a sentence, you have any pairs, you have a number, any three words, you have a number. It's not really interpretable, even you call them importance. So we need to organize them. So this paper with Chandan uh, and Jamie, we use hierarchical clustering using the CD scores, which we designed earlier and to form, form, form a kind of interpretation tree we call um, ACD to really see what's going on, right? So this not very good is being predicted as sentiment wise negative. So why this, prediction happened, at the bottom line, we have scores not very good. The, the color shading tells you how positive or negative they are and very good become very positive and then flipped at the last stage to say that that's where it became negative, this phrase. And you can do something more complicated than three words, right? So this is um, our earliest work. And then we generalize two, two images. So you can do the same thing to see which parts for prediction on puck? You can see scales are very important. Even if you remove the puck in this image, you're gonna still predict 
PAC because the correlation between SCADES and PAC. Then we run two small uh, human experiments to show that our measures are better than the other existing measures. So this is a three um, well-known uh, public data set. SST is a Stanford uh, sentiment analysis uh, kind of data set and then digit and image net. And the, on the left, what we had, we have four different methods. So for a given message, uh, say our method ACD, we have the original deep learning model giving you the prediction, and then we interpret it through our ACD. And the subject is drawn that. And then we mess around with the weights, randomize certain weights, but keep the same prediction. So made a corrupted or bad model. And then we ask the subject, human subject to see, based on the interpretation, can you tell which is a good model, which is a bad model? Because we're inviting them to use their domain knowledge. This is things people know to see whether it makes sense. And then you can see that our methods come on top. For MNIST, basically all the methods perform pretty similarly, but ImageNet actually our organized methods work really better. You might CD without organizing, it's just too messy. People cannot really use um, you know, effective way. And on the right, it's just, this is no corrupted data. You just ask based on the interpretation of all methods, which one do you trust? And you can see our methods seem to earn most of the time uh, overall trustworthiness. And of course, it can be just because it's trusting, it can be, it's pretty. That's why people tend to trust that it's clean. But because we have the first experiment, I think together really show our uh, method has an edge. And then we feed it back this um, importance measures to improve um, deep learning model. So this is led by a visiting student, Laura Rieger, and the mentor by Chandon and Jamie, that we use this back as a penalty to uh, say that we know that this is noise features. So human knowledge come in to say that these are noise features and we see that the algorithm has a lot of reliance on them. And we want the algorithm to rely less on these noisy features. We don't have nothing to do with the, the, what's going on. Oh, you can say that um, by law, we don't want to rely this prediction on gender and we can reduce the reliance. So, so this is, a way to use interpretation to help us to improve algorithms to, to conform with human um, understanding. So I start pushing the group to do science because I was never excited about sentiment analysis. Um, and there was an opportunity to work with cosmologist uh, Francois Lanusi, who was a postdoc in a, like a tripos grant with my postdoc Usu Kar and and Francois brought in two colleagues from cosmology. So this is a, a scientific problem. Francois had been working on, try to understand the origin of the universe. So they simulate the data. And one important um, parameter is called omega n. It's kind of about how much the space was occupied in the beginning of the universe by mass in the beginning. And then the purple image is simulated image of what we could observe today with telescope, something called the gravitational lens uh, images. So that's why we know the truth here. So they want to understand uh, how to estimate this omega m using the data we can observe. And this is simulated so they can compare different methods. And deep learning came ahead with a ResNet with 10 million parameters. That was the best method at the time, beating all other methods. But when we start working with them, we said, well, can I help you to understand why your model, the deep learning model works so well? And they said, well, we care about frequency domain. We, care, we don't care about the image domain. Don't give me this like in pixel-wise importance. That's not a meaningful. So relevance comes in and we went to the free domain and we can do the free transform T theta and T theta inverse and make a compound model or transform model. F is the filter residual net. And we can plug into a transpose and make F prime. And then we can generalize our interpretation method to that domain and give them uh, important scores. So the original image uh, up left 
And then you can see the, the Fourier uh, transformed images at frequency 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and so forth. And then uh, the score, actually we went back to just a score because we only need each frequency one score in the compensational sense. And 0 0.25 seems to be most important and that actually coincides with their understanding. That's why things are more Gaussian-like. And then the frequency, high frequency, um, don't seem to be that important by omega m, and that can help them to reduce the simulation cost because they simulate in the free domain. And then independently, um, I was suggesting let's go to local free transform because I work on free uh, wavelengths 20 years ago, a signal processing um, problem. And then Francois actually also suggested wavelets because I didn't know that um, people already using fixed wavelets to do the same problem. So this is just a very tall example to show that the other methods don't really work as well as uh, our methods. And also you have to generalize them to the different domains. So coding was also um, a challenge. And this is a single importance. So deep lift works, but deep lift generally has problem with more like compositional importance. And share probably can be generalized, but it's, it's quite a bit of work. And for this problem, can see that um, we decided not to pursue the other methods. So now we have um, our method kind of validated with a scientific problem to be useful. And then the same scientific problem drove us to look at wavelets. And then we actually use a cellular biology problem uh, from uh, Upa Yahula, uh, who is a collaborator we have been working on before this for a couple of years uh, from the Berkeley Bioimaging Center. And this is the nearest paper last year, led by Wu Suk and Chen Lin. So before us, people already tried to understand complex big deep learning models by something called distillation. People first started trying to get smaller neural nets, and people also tried decision trees and also additive models. So the context really uh, helps to decide what's the form of distillation you want, right? So. We definitely have energy efficiency problem with these huge models of deep learning. So there's definitely interest in make smaller, uh, more efficient deep learning model. And it's also a good match with cognitive science, neuroscience, understanding our brain. And then for other problem in medical, um, maybe even in business situations, decision trees are very uh, interpretable. I think social scientists also for decision trees and additive model just in general want to, things to be additive. So our uh, goal was to use uh, wavelets as a form of interpretability because in physical sciences, Fourier transform, Fourier domain is very interpretable and wavelet local Fourier transform is very interpretable. So we want to distill deep learning model driven by the relevance of cosmology to um, wavelets and want to improve interpretability, compression, efficiency. So this is, uh, I think people, who um, in statistics for 20 some years, we all heard about wavelets, right? In the 90s or 30 years, people had really, that was the frontier of statistics for a while, which is wavelets. And I still like wavelets a lot because it has this elegance of harmonic analysis of mathematics and has been very useful for uh, signal processing. And I think today, I think we can still take advantage of deep learning and make it useful, more popular. It is very neat and useful. So we we'll have the different tiling of time series and free domain and wavelet is the uh, um, most smart tiling of the time and frequency domain. So you can concentrate. You can allow different frequencies for different time periods. And you can also reduce the relying on the fine, like a grade of frequency and high frequency. You think the signal is mostly in the low frequency. So great books by Malad and Mayer. And my um, interest in wavelet is also because of neuroscience. Right, so if you look at the first layer of Alex Nance, early um, deep learning, on the right, you basically get kind of empirical wavelet sound. And on the left is mathematical Gabal wavelet filters. And if you go back to neuroscience physiology in 19, late 1950s, Hubble and Wiesel got Nobel Prize in the 80s because they discovered the first visual cortex V1 is X like edge detectors and X like wavelets. That's what we discovered from the deep learning or diction learning, because I think the visual system and the natural world co-evolved. 
So they both have hard science and also computational results. And so we're gonna do what we did for Fourier, but now we are looking for this wavelet transform. So we're looking for this wavelet transform for psi, and we can do the same thing, put a bigger F around on top of ResNet and also with the inverse transform the wavelet. And the goal is to how do we find the low pass and high pass filters corresponding to this wavelet transform. So this is orthogonal wavelet transform. If you're giving a mother wavelet, the program is set for you. You do different uh, like shift and different scale, the whole program, you get all the um, filters at different uh, frequencies and locations. So the goal is to find the mother wavelet or equivalently find the frequency, the, the high pass and low pass filters. So we designed this loss function, which is the heart of our work, with the first part saying that I want my wavelet transform to be basically uh, invertible, right? You want the reconstruction loss to be small. And now expand on the second part. So forget about second part for now. I will tell you what it is. And the third part is taking advantage of the rest net, say in cosmology or retrofitted. So we're going to use PyTorch ability to do differentiation very quickly. And we didn't use our ACD because computation is too heavy. We use the derivative and sparsity L1 for the interpretation loss. Without the last part, you could still do it. That's just you looking for a wavelet transform uh, so that um, data driven. So it's more like uh, unsupervised. So the second part is really looking at all the wavelet equations in all these wonderful books on wavelets and turn them into loss uh, into penalties. So if you have a mother wavelet, um, then you have a program to expand on the high pass and low filters indicated by H and G, and they have to satisfy certain equations. We took the difference, squared them, and summed them up at different scales, different locations, and that's become terms in our uh, wavelet loss. And there are other loss uh, equations that are not completely independent, but it's okay, we're just leading a penalty and so on and so forth. So this is the way we, we basically turn these equations in wavelet books into penalties and use this um, modern computing power to search and use gradient descent. And this part already explained, right? We, we end up using uh, uh, like um, derivative type of um, interpretation instead of RCD. And we have our one, so we want fewer places to high, uh, have high derivatives. So this is uh, just proof of concept. If you simulate a noisy version of existing wavelet, and we can really find, recover the ground wavelet on the right, and the distilled wavelet is estimated, and we just build a small fully connected network. And you can, this is an easier way to compare. So if the ground truth is WC's, who's one of the most um, important research in deep learning now at Duke, Ingrid Devashis, DPC5. But you start with Koifan, another important researcher, Koifan from Yale. And then they, you recover the truth. And you can see that if we start from SIM5, it's another well-known wavelet, you don't do as well, but you still do pretty well. So back to the cosmology problem. Right, so as we were told by Francois, people already used fixed wavelets. So look at the top one, right? So now we're replacing a fixed wavelet with distilled data-driven wavelet. And now there's a peak counting method existing in the literature, we just use that. So we only replace one step of this peak counting method in cosmology. And now if you look at the bottom uh, table, AWD, adaptive wavelet distillation, our method use uh, Francois ResNet of 10 million parameters, we get the best result uh, in terms of error. It's 10 to the minus two, so it's not 1.2, it's, it's a pretty small scale. And we reduce the number of parameters by 10,000 fold from 10 million to 1,000. And 
You look at ResNet, it's 1.15. So we improve by 15, around 15, 10, 15%. And the middle ones are different existing methods are all much worse. But if you look at the last number, this is a number if we don't use ResNet, we don't use the interpretation laws. We only use the first two terms, just get adaptive wavelets, then you do much worse. So this is shows that we borrow code and code knowledge from the ResNet, which is very much black box, into something now very integrable. One, one thousand and it's wavelet, so there's this one wavelet. And this is just the peak method. I don't want to describe its existing method. So now you look at what's the wavelet we found, right? We have two parameters for the wavelet loss and for the interpretation loss. And you see that it's a symmetric, mostly symmetric wavelet. And the wavelet filters just move to a different location and different scale. And this is really capturing the signal about the difference of mass in the regions of space with large densities and their surroundings. And this is the most important for omega m. It's about density, right? We know omega m is about density. So this is, gives the interpretation in a more precise form. And you can see there are other things we didn't like, right? There's asymmetric ones and really said that there's a symmetry and the density high is important. And it's not just the high, but it's also the contrast from the surrounding areas at different scales and different locations. So I usually like to have another real um, case study for methodology development. So we happen to be working with Skolko already with the Berkey um, Imaging Center, Bioimaging Center. So this is a completely different problem from completely the uh, science from biology. So this is classroom mediated endocytosis, CME. It's a very fundamental process in cellular biology. To code this nature reviews, it's a key process in vesicular trafficking. Vesicular means um, like a cellular level, transports a wide range of cargo molecules from the cell surface to the interior. So this is how the cells get things in, uh, food, other chemicals. So you look at the left of this um, graph, the cargo is already lining up using the endocytic uh, proteins already cross the membranes, uh, collecting these little guys like keys. They are the nutrients or something to be brought in. And then the surface will cave. And then there's a protein called actin, act like scissors, cut it. So you have this ball coming in with cargo inside. And then you have an unpacking process. Another um, molecule has to help something called oxalin to unpack it. And then you get the food or get the nutrients in or get whatever the cell wants. So this process can be started by a clustering, but now might not be completed without the action of the oxygen. And for cellular biologists, they want to understand this uh, molecular partner problem to really observe this process, to understand for different cells, maybe different um, tissues do different way, maybe uh, cancer cells do differently, right? So this is just understanding basic psychology, uh, uh, cell biology. So this is the image we do um, in Galco's and Colabor's labs. And we try to track the clustering, which is the orange signal, but that doesn't mean you see a peak of the orange signal. You actually need to also observe the more expensive uh, oxygen, which really indicates the completion of the process. So the problem we try to solve, help to solve is um, predict uh, the green signal, the peak from the orange signal, which is a classroom. And my students, both um, Chen De and Xiaoli, sat with um, Gaoko in his lab half of the time, really work next to them to understand the process. And also there's a, also funny reasons because the data is terabytes of data. And actually the delay is sitting in Evans Hall where my our office is just too slow. So for that reason, they had to sit next to them too, to have the machines next in the next room. But I usually want my students to sit in the labs anyways. Um, so we have already this AWD developed for cosmology and deep learning directly on this very fuzzy uh, cellular videos don't work. So we'll have to use a very much a physics driven, chemical driven, like chemical knowledge, uh, chemistry knowledge driven way to extract a time series follow these little guys uh, around 
and then deep learning works. So directly to video doesn't work. And we distilled another wavelet, which you can see the difference is not symmetric. And for this, the LSTM, it's a version of recurrent neural network has uh, 1000 parameters. Uh, after the distillation with uh, data driven distillation, we end up with only 30 parameters. So this is really interpretable. We also improve the performance. This is the test R squared, so want it to be high. And we also include, improve the performance by 10 to 15%. So you look at the table, right? AWD have 0.26, LSTM was 0.23. If you use fixed wavelet, it's 0.2. And if you don't use the uh, LSTM, the deep learning model, you get 0.23. So this again improve the performance, the prediction, and also interpretability. This is when you end up looking at 30 um, uh, numbers now instead of 1,000. So this is the wavelength we picked. It's not symmetric as the cosmology case. It's really uh, confirming again what we knew already. So this project had been going on two or three years. And in the beginning, we didn't have enough data. We could, LSTM didn't work. We basically hand tune a lot of features. We observed that things had to rise. We just look at a lot of these curves and picked you know, the feature we think might be relevant. So later we got made data and uh, LSTM worked. Then uh, this is distillation. And now it's working better than the hand tune method. So this is really uh, confirming what we understood already that you need the clustering, the orange signal to have a, a peak and followed by a sharp drop, that's very highly predictive of a successful CME event. So again, this become interpretable and we're picking up at different locations of this wavelet and possibly also at different scales. So the last part of the talk is um, back to this vertical data sign. Vertical means truthful. And before I was giving this talk under the name of predictability, computability, and stability three principles for data science and the paper came out. So I was giving this talk for like three or four years before the paper came out in 2020 with my former student now at uh, UCSF, Khan Kumbir. So returning to the theme of the, the title of the talk, trustworthy AI, as I alluded to earlier, is that we need to really share and build best pro practices to maximize the promise or be preventative. There's always a need for damage control, but I think we should really work hard on preventative um, approaches instead of something bad happened and then we kind of try to control the damage. And this is a slide I find very useful, um, which actually came from teaching undergraduate class. When I try to explain things more clearly to them than what I had been. And it's really point out that the algorithms and the analysis a lot of our students are trained in, they are really mental constructs. They don't have to bear any reality. Unless we provide the evidence that they capture reality. And the data is not reality, data is representation. So things could go wrong there too. You can have reality, but your representation of data can be very bad quality and you don't have reality. You have rep a bad representation. I also keep always feature in our mind. What the algorithm you're gonna develop or the decision pipeline develop will be useful in what situations? And that's really the P. P is not just about predictability, it's also about the future. And then about the decision, the human impact, the relevance. So these five are not, uh, circles, I feel like it's very important even for myself to keep in mind so we don't get in the weeds of things and just start believing things that's another. So formally we're, in the paper, we define the vertical data science as extract reliable produce, reproducible information using and enrich technical language. What I had in mind when we put it there is deep learning is a very complex object. We don't even have enough technical language to describe what's going on. Right? We know that things are unstable, but we really don't know how to describe the geometry or even algebraically what's going on near or a little far away from the data points. And we have to emphasize a good communication, that's a level of interpretability and really pay more attention to empirical evidence 
And a few overall statistics and also machine learning maybe as a field, we still don't pay enough attention to empirical evidence. We still like new methods, shiny toys better and papers better than really solving problems. I joke about um, that you know, papers are published, careers are made, um, real problems unsolved, right? So, so it's like, we always do a lot of useless stuff. I mean, but the proportion of useless stuff today with the paper pressure is just huge. And I think we have to actually be uh, pushed back before we uh, as a community lose credibility. And back to the data science life cycle, right? Human judgment costs. And people have to do their job. And people ask me, I was giving this talk with a group of students uh, in Colombia. And the question was asked like, what incentives we need for people to do this quality controlled uh, data science life cycle? I think I came up with the best argument ever. I think it's in your job description to do quality control data science life cycle. We shouldn't need more incentives because it's our job to do it. And there's no more incentive to be needed if we want to do a good job with what we're supposed to do. So the PCS framework is try to integrate um, machine learning and statistics. I was very much influenced by my late colleague, Leo Brahman, who had a paper called Two Cultures, right? So I really tried to make one culture out of machine learning and statistics and to expand on both uh, fields as well. So stability is very much a significant expansion on sample to sample variability and robustity and stability from control theory to the whole data science life cycle, starting from problem formulation and data cleaning, right? Different people end up with different versions of a clean data. Do we get the same results? And with computation power, we can actually um, check that and make sure that we have enough stability to trust our results. I start um, pursuing this uh, idea of stability 2013, as Dave alluded to, I had the honor to give the two key lecture and I was trying very hard to connect with two keys work on robust statistics. I was having problem interpreting some neuroscience model using Lasso. When you change the data by 10%, the selective variables change. So I put it together and advocated for stability uh, at the modeling stage for reproducibility and for minimum requirement for interpretability. And later expanded to every step of data science life cycle. So I hope I can convince you that, oh, if you're not already, stability is a no brainer. It's a common sense. I think a lot of good work already use different form of stability because such a common sense principle, Asian principle. If I want to be highbrow, I got this quote from a philosopher friend about what Plato said. For true opinions, as long as they remain a fine thing and all they do is good, but they're not willing to remain long and escape from a man's mind so that they're not worth much until one ties them down. So ties them down for me means stability. That's why knowledge is priced higher than correct opinion and knowledge differs from correct opinion in being tied down. So this is something wise people like Plato said thousands of years ago, I hope it's now common sense. And just to give you a little more detail, what I mean by uh, stability in the data science life cycle, I had my final project for my applied statistics and machine learning class at PhD lab in Berkeley, work for a month as a team with a doctor, a collaborator from UCSF on some public data called PCON clinical decision instrument regarding tra traumatic brain injury for kids. And I should thank my collaborator, Aaron, Kamblas, my TA, uh, Omar, and also Chandan for helping on this project. So three teams work on the same data. I told them not to talk to each other. And they clean the data different ways. One team managed to clean away 23% of the data. And on the clean data, they got the best result. I thought we later saw all too much. And they did different visualizations. And they used a different interval methods. Some went for decision trees, and some went for logistic regression. And they even used different performance metrics. So for some death count prediction for COVID, we use different three different metrics to make sure our prediction method actually works. 
not just under one metric. And then they end up with different conclusions. So this is, we all know this is a problem and we really need to do some stability analysis. But each step, we have a knot, we have five choices. We cannot do all possibilities, that'd be too many for computation reasons, but we should at least sample, almost like um, quality debation. At least a couple. I think we should at least keep two copies of clean data. And if you really want to reflect, this will reflect the full uncertainty in the whole data science life cycle. Statisticians, we pride ourselves in, we are serious about uncertainty, but are we? If we only care about the modeling stage and ignoring all the problems we know there, we don't formally take that into account. So this is attempt to formally take that into account about uncertainties before we write down a mathematical model. That there with algorithmic, uh, advances, we can actually see the stability of basic make uh, algorithmic statistics instead of more uh, calculus-based statistics. So this is really a call for us to seriously consider, especially data cleaning. We know that it's really important and the different data imputation methods, right? And people already use different models. If we're really serious, we should really clean the test data versus the uh, training data by different people. So to take advantage or take into account that level of uncertainty because two people clean data indifferently. And of course, computation, uh, computability is always needed. And computability here is also include data simulations. And scientists were already ahead of us. So the, the paper also, PCS paper also has a section on perturbation intervals. It's really a generalization of what people in climate are already doing. They always show us the global temperature rise at the end of the century with nine different models, not one model. And that gives you a good idea about from 1.5 degrees to 5.5 degrees. So back to, um, I do want to leave something uh, sometime for discussion. So I just say that we did do this uh, certain perturbation analysis or stability analysis for the two uh, problems, more at the algorithm level, not the data cleaning level. So we did partial stability analysis. And same for the uh, cosmology, things um, were pretty stable. And since I've been on this path of generalizing stability so to the whole pipeline and using predictability as a grounding principle, stability principle doesn't make sense without reality check. You only go for stability, you, many things are stable, but it's not relevant. So you really want the relevance through pre predictability and reality change. So I was talking to a student, a student in my uh, Britain Park is finishing a chapter on his thesis, try to generalize the PCS framework to uh, reinforcement learning. There, we encountered the problem where you're doing offline data, log data. And there we encounter that, what's uh, predictability and what's reality change. So it's really the offline data should be related to the actual environment you will deploy, whatever the clinical decision rules, it's the human knowledge serve as reality check. So P in my mind is not just about predictability in the quantitative senses in supervised learning, it's really about reality check and sometimes run qualitative knowledge. So I think we are more confident that this is a very useful uh, framework. We have now eight different uh, projects, successful use, this uh, PCS. So it's not like a cookie Carter framework. It's really a framework try to help us to think and borrow knowledge from experience from one person to the other under these considerations that had to be put into context and design quantitative uh, uh, methods to reflect and document. So um, documentation is very important. And we also have, um, kind of a tempo template being developed. So the last year or two, we have been developing software to make um, this uh, PCS framework easy to do. And so check out my website and C in PCS had a lot to do with data inspired simulations. So we have a sim shell being uh, developed. And for future directions, we have more try to use some, get some theory going for relate to um, inspired by the AWD and really have more examples, maybe in um, 
medicine like EEG and really have understand one AWD is a good method. I don't believe AWD will work for anything. Uh, nothing works over time in statistics. So it's really find out why it works well and why. And we love it to go to um, mechanistic models. So my, my group, myself, actively working with different centers like Hutchinson Research Center and Genome Center at Berkeley, try to bring these ideas to the service centers of data and uh, analysis, and hopefully even um, we're working with, working with AWS Auto ML, um, Gluyang to put our ideas and software on this uh, more accessible platforms. I'm finishing a book with my uh, former student, current postdoc, Rebecca Butter. As many of you have heard the early version of this announcement, but we really need to finish this year with MIT Press. And after we submit for hard print copies, um, we, we have permission from MIT for free co uh, online copy. So this is the cover the whole pipeline and we try to make it accessible to people who don't have a lot of mathematical background. There are a lot of great mathematical books so we're not trying to duplicate that, but really try to emphasize the PCS principles throughout all the pipeline and introduce introduction of method too. So here are the papers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. So maybe we can open it up for questions. Just have people uh, go ahead and speak up unless we get a, a flood. Hi, hello, this is Jorge. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Ben. Hi. Concerning your last question about which DNNs may be more uh, amenable to be distilled by AWD, yeah. You played with LSTMs and you played with uh, residual networks. Yeah. Do you have any insights about how they compare in, in, in that sense? I feel like both problems are like physical science problems. I think it's physics. I mean, at the cellular level, at that level, a lot of physics at play. So my hunch is that this large flexible models really it's empowered by the search power. And they can get us to a good place, but without interpretation. So I think a lot of the structure of neural nets, it's really a very flexible way of searching huge spaces, which we haven't seen before. And if you look at AlphaGo and uh, AlphaFold, all of them, I think it's really the amazing searchability of the computers that we would take advantage of the LSTM. But why these two examples? I think fundamentally there's something about wavelets. It's fundamentally a good match to this um, physical science problems based on physics. And then, but if you, without, we cannot find what they are without the deep learning powerful search modern search uh, engine. So that's kind of my rough uh, intuition. And yeah. I would be surprised that we, with um, for some magical data like EEGs and things like that, I think my guess I'm trying to work with a professor from USUC on that. I think will also will work very well. But um, for genomics with SNPs, unless we have a different form, I'm not sure it will work there. For so for continuous signals and when Fourier and wavelength work in general, even not the best performance, we can have a leg up because we can now move to data driven wavelets before we, we, we were dealing with fixed wavelets. So the, the, the power deep learning is adding is the data driven mm -hmm. wavelets. And as I, sh I have shown you in the two examples, without the ResNet or LSTM, you get data driven wavelets, you lose performance. But whether the cost is worth it for every case, that's a different question, right? Um, it's impressive, alpha go, alpha fold. But you look at the human computing energy put into it, it's not really replicable for every case we want to deal with. And this huge language model coming out from this big tax is also a question. Mm -hmm. How sustainable if you want to solve every problem with this huge, gigantic uh, computing? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm hoping that um, this interval machine, interval deep learning will help us to go small. But probably we can use this huge model somehow too, because they already trained it, they already used the energy. 
Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. I'll jump in with a question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned the, the Bryman Two Cultures paper, which um, which had a profound impact on, on me when I was a, a young scholar. So I, 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 I love that you mentioned that. Um, uh, in a lot of the, the, the case studies that you've mentioned, um, you know, you, you emphasize, you know, the importance of understanding the physics or, or the, uh, the biology un, un, underlying, um, you know, the data. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in the two cultures paper, there's op opening up the box to, to understand, you know, the, the causation that, that, that gives rise to the data. How do you think of that in, in, in terms of the data science life cycle uh, uh, process diagram that you showed? Where, where, where does understanding the causality, um, you know, fit into that data science life cycle? I would think that if we, you have the luxury of have a good collaborator, that the, the the science should be from the beginning. So you, you develop the problem formulation together with the scientists. And then you talk to them when you clean the data because the subject knowledge matters, which makes sense to clean away, which is not. So if you have the luxury, you should have the domain knowledge every step of the way. I'm really into integrated team or a team brain. So a cardiology project I just finished with a cardiologist at Stanford, that's how uh, we worked, right? We were stuck. And then I, I took my team to Stanford, stayed in Stanford for a week, and we jump started the process. I met everyone in the under team. And then my post, my student, and work with them as an integrated team. So it required them to go our way and we go their way. So I think we have this unprecedented um, opportunity to not just play in somebody's backyard also in somebody's front yard, if I dare to paraphrase uh, John Tukey. Because a lot of the new form of data, the, data, the, the domain knowledge and the domain expert are not have intimate knowledge either because the technology just moves so fast, like RNA sick, a lot, you know, but they also have knowledge we don't have. So it's really as a partner, uh, embed ourselves as much as possible. And I love science, so I find this, really, really fascinating about the cellular process. I just get a kick out of it. I think I have very boring uh, undergraduate education only on math. So this is my opportunity to do my general education. Yeah, so I think it should be every step of the way. Does that make sense? Uh, very much so, thank you. Thank you for the good question. I just hope you guys find this useful and then do better, right? I don't think this is really a sad thing. You know, it's a start and I hope you find it useful to build your work. I mean, the key is quality control process. And we have thought a lot, hope we'll give you a leg up if you build on our work or revise our work, but completely fine if you want something completely different. I mean, the key is to do responsible reproducible data science. And um, really hope, I think this is probably a group of people actually care about solving problems. And, and I think this is probably the right forum for you guys to um, consider what we have done and develop further. Thank you, Ben, for a really inspiring talk. Thank you for having me. I guess I'll be meeting many of you 